did. We, we thought he's the one we'd been longing for and looking for. I gotta kind of bring that into today's environment. We thought he's the one that quote heal our marriage. That's what we thought he'd do. We thought he'd make us well. We thought he'd make sure he'd give it a good job. We, we, but he they said he obviously wasn't. Some of the women, you know how the women are. Some of the women told us that they'd seen him. We sent some representatives out. The tomb was empty. They didn't see Jesus, so they didn't believe him. And they had just kind of given up. Jesus didn't say, oh, be of good cheer. He said, you fools. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, oh, fools and slow of heart. Like, how fast does it take you to catch on to the things of God? Wow. Are you slow of heart? Huh? Some people, you got to beat them on the head, you know, and say it over and over and over and finally gets through. See, these are, these are not premier disciples. If they don't correct that, they're going to be cut off. There's people like this. You, they pro you probably don't have them here in the first state of Kansas, but we got them head thin and finitum in Missouri. They're all over the place. Shouldn't, shouldn't Christ have raised from the dead and entered into his glory? And he began to open up to them the scripture. See, they were familiar with scripture. See, a lot of Christ professed disciples today, they don't know the scripture. They're not scriptural people. They're scripturally illiterate. How about their church members? They're good, good church members in standing. But he expounded to them the things concerning himself. Well, the day waxed on it. How long this went on, we don't know, but pretty soon it started to grow dark and said he made as though he would go further. That's what Jesus is now. This is how he is. We're being introduced to the real Jesus. He made as though he's going to go further. And they had to ask, oh, don't go, don't turn in here, turn in. The night's coming on, and you need to turn in here with us. So, see, until, until you say to Jesus, I want you to abide with me. I want you to stay with me. Don't leave. Don't leave. He'll walk right off and leave you in the dark. That's the way Jesus is. Well, he turned aside. And while they were breaking bread, while they were eating, all of a sudden, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished immediately. Because <laughs> he didn't want people to know him after the flesh. See? So he vanished immediately. Mm -hmm. It had already been a long day. Jesus had raised from the dead. They'd been in Jerusalem, I would seven, eight miles away, something like that. They walked all day, they're tired. They got up and made the trip back. <coughs> Same day, still the first day of the week, made the trip back to tell the disciples. On the way, they said, Oh, didn't our heart burn within Amen. us when he opened us the scriptures? Remember how we, oh, have you ever had a burning heart? I thought that'd be a good name for a church, a church of the burning heart. <laughs> Not hell burn, heaven burn. <laughs> now, Jesus had raised from the dead. <clears throat> but these men did not know anything significant had happened on that day. Now let me remind you what had happened on that day. Some of these things I'm going to mention, they did probably know about. He was nailed to a cross, of course, and he, he was offered some vinegar to drink. Jesus <clears throat> refused it. That happened. Some people down at the bottom of the cross, it's such a boring afternoon, they just gambled. They cast lots for his garment. That's, that's how boring the whole thing was to them. And some had said of some Matthew 27, 34, sitting down, they watched him there. Just like, I don't know, like a circus, just, let's watch this. 
Some people walking by, they hurled epithets at him. They said, he said he did try to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Come on now, let's see you do it. Chief priests come by. They said he saved others. He cannot save himself. The thieves went on each side of him. At that time, both of the thieves railed on him. Scripture says there was darkness from the sixth to the ninth hour, from noon to three. We understand this was the time when he actually did bear the sin of the world away. At the ninth hour, he cried out, my God. He wasn't just quoting scripture now, brethren. He said this. My God, this is the first time from eternity through all the earth that him and the Father were separated. And of all times, it had to be when sin was on, which he'd never felt the defilement of before. Why hast thou forsaken me? And the scripture says he yielded up his spirit. See, Jesus didn't die like most men die. He dismissed his spirit. See, the death of Christ was a, the death was a mirror. Jesus hadn't sinned, and the person that doesn't sin can't die. Now see this now. Death is the penalty for sin. Jesus hadn't sinned. See, he had to dismiss his spirit to die. He couldn't die otherwise. He dismissed his spirit. As soon as he did, the temple veil, which was so gigantic, I guess hardly anyone can de describe it, was torn in half from the top, from the heaven side down. <laughs> torn. Signifying, one gospel writer says, that the way into the holiest where God is is now opened up. Then there was a violent earthquake. The rocks split. We'd say boulders. Boulders split. The tombs of many saints were opened up. And they came forth, but they didn't go, they didn't, they didn't actually come out until after Jesus' resurrection. When they didn't come out, they went in the city and testified to many, so it must have been some contemporary people that died of note. A centurion standing by observing all this, he didn't say this must have been a bad man for this to happen. He said, surely this was the Son of God. And some people, it says, in Luke 23, 48, beat their breasts. They just asked, that's just all they could do. Just. There's seven saints. Jesus said at the cross at the time, my Father forgive them. They don't know what they do. That was the first thing. Said to the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. Said to his mother, woman, behold thy son, which is John to John, behold thy mother. He said, I thirst. Said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he cried out, it is finished. That's what happened outwardly. That is not what redeemed you. Amen. I want to spend a little time on this. Prefacing my remarks by saying, all this happened, and Cleopas and his friend didn't think anything had happened. The things that save us are what happened behind the scenes, things nobody could see. That's what saves us. Not the external cross. And while I'm here when it says we're the blood of Christ, he's not talking about the blood from the crown of thorns, and the blood from the hands, and the blood from the feet. That's not the blood he's talking about, TV evangelist notwithstanding. He's talking about the blood that came out of his side because it confirmed he was dead. That's the blood, water and the blood. That's the, what he's talking about. Now I want to deal with, remember, Cleopas and his friend didn't think anything would happen. Why didn't they? Why is it the 
they didn't think anything had happened. Jesus had the last few months of his ministry had talked about this to his disciples and all of them. Son of man is going to be betrayed in the hands of men, be crucified the third day rise from the dead. He said it's over and over and over and over again. But they couldn't connect what Jesus himself had said with what had happened. Why couldn't they do that? They didn't have peace. That's why. Their hearts were agitated. They weren't peaceful. And you will not experience the great blessing of God while you have an agitated heart. You don't believe me? Check up on when you had one. You weren't saying, bless God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. That's not what you're saying when you're agitated. Now this, this meeting is about spiritual peace. The purpose of this message is to tell, expound what you do when you don't have peace. Here's the things that happened that they didn't know. Nobody else knew either. Jesus, fulfilling the word of John in John 1.29, took away the sin of the world. Hebrews 9.26 said he appeared to put away sin. I wanted to spend a moment on this because a lot of people don't know what that means. You say to people today, good old USA citizens, Jesus died for your sins. Most people don't have the faintest idea what that means. They think of Jesus dying like a martyr being killed on the battlefield. They don't know what that means. What it means is, God gathered together all sin. It was a composite of all sin that had ever been sinned. Only one exception, and that's the sin of Satan and the angels. Jesus didn't die for that. He gathered it together, follow me here, that one sin could not be forgiven till all sin had been taken away. You've got to, you've got to see this. So far as God's concerned, it's not a sin. The sin is not the issue now. The Son is the issue. That's the issue now. Amen. And the pre primary sin, the fundamental sin, is not believing on Christ. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit, when He has come, He'll convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Yet, that's the fountain. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes Jesus is the Son of God. First John 5, 5. So if you don't overcome the world, you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. I do too. No, you don't. No, you don't. If you're overcome by the world, it's because you do not really believe Jesus is the Son of God. Not at that moment you didn't. Because that's the victory. Satan has no alternative when he confronts a person who is convinced Jesus is the Son of God. He has no <coughs> approach to that. There's a couple of things Satan can do. If you say no, <coughs> he has no retort. <laughs> no, the grace of God will teach you to say no to ungodliness and worldly lust. That is 3 5. And my point here is Jesus accomplished this when Cleopas and his friend didn't think anything was done. He took away from God's presence all sin, He atoned. See, sin's got to be paid for. God just can't forget your sin because he loves you so much. I know people say this, but they're wrong. These people shouldn't believe them. No. Somebody had to, sin had to be punished. Every sin had to be, every sin had to be punished. Every wrong word, every wrong deed, every imagination. It had to pay the price. Because God has a holy nature. And when a holy nature meets a divine person, oh, it's an explosion. 
So Jesus took all the sin away. Then he satisfied God. The scripture says, God saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. That's I'll not require anymore. There's nothing else you have to offer God to atone for your sin. Amen. Not a good deed, but it's already settled. Sin, the sin question, as far as God's concerned, is settled. And if you'll believe on His Son, who settled it? God will write His law on your heart, put it in your mind, and remember your sins no more. Amen. That's the way it is. But they didn't think anything had happened, see. <coughs> Jesus, in his death, reconciled the world to God. Now, before any one person could be reconciled, the whole race had to be reconciled. That is, the, the door had to be opened to come to God. God had to view mankind as something other than an enemy. And Jesus opened the door, so that was, he reconciled the world to God. That's category of state in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. He reckoned, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their sins unto them. This is in the Bible. We don't, we don't have to question it. But this happened. See, if you if you have Jesus, you've got everything. Amen. All the fullness of the Godhead goes in him bodily, Colossians says. And in, you are complete in Him, Colossians 2.10 says. So if you got Jesus, I don't mean like a profession of Jesus. You understand that's what we're talking about. If you have Jesus, you have everything, the reconciliation. In other words, when you come to God, God doesn't look at you as an alien. If you're in Christ, as an alien, you can make your request known unto Him. Whatever they are, whatever they are. <clears throat> Make your request known to him, Philippians 4, 6. And then what God will do, in exchange, he'll give you peace. He may not answer your request at all. But if you have peace, so what? <laughs> if I got peace and I'm not agitated, what do I care whether it's answered or not? <laughs> Experience will teach you this is the truth. Reconcile the world to himself. He was made to be sin for us. Boy, that's a, that's a staggering statement. He was made to be sin for us. Like when Jesus was born, he was God manifest in the flesh. Right? When Jesus died, he was sin manifested in the flesh. God condemned sin in the flesh, the flesh of his son, Romans 8, 3. So he's made... Colossians 5.21, he made him to be sin for us. He did to Jesus what he does to sin. He forsook him. The prophet, uh, Zephaniah, I believe it is, said that God had said, Awake, O sword, against the shepherd. And God, with his sword, struck the shepherd. Why? So it wouldn't strike us. That's why. It wasn't easy for Jesus to die. He was made to be sin for us. When Jesus died, God didn't see Jesus as his son when he died. He saw him as sin. So if you wonder how God feels about sin, Look what he did to Jesus. It's God who delivered him up for our offenses. It's God who did it. By his stripes were healed. Those were not the stripes the Romans put on him. It's the stripes God put on him. Jesus did not save you by what the Romans did to him. Got to get this firmly in your mind because there's a lot of people preach contrary to this. He said those... Forty stripes, save one. The forget the Romans didn't practice forty stripes, save one. That was uniquely Jewish. Right. You weren't saved by Jesus. You are not healed by Jesus' stripes, and your healing is of the soul. The psalmist prayed on one occasion, "Heal my soul." Peter gave an exposition of it. He said that. Uh, 
by whose stripes we are healed. For, 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 <coughs> we were a sheep going astray, but now we have returned to the chief shepherd and bishop of our soul. So it was an inner healing, not an outward healing. Now there's no question about God being able to heal you, but Jesus didn't have to die for you to be healed. Sure. Now, he healed people before he died. Mm -hmm. But this inward, that didn't happen before Jesus died. Now remember, these were talking about things Cleopas and his friend didn't know happened. He was made a curse for us. This is Galatians 3.13. He was made to be a curse for us. See, that was a staggering words to, to hear say. He didn't say he was cursed. It says he was made to be a curse for us, for it was written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. He was cursed. That happened when Jesus died. But these two men, he didn't know anything happened. And he, he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Some people can't distinguish between commandments and ordinances. They have a, the commandments see, were embodied, summarized in the Ten Commandments. The ordinances were the outward procedures that were based on the commandments. Some people call it a ceremonial law. But it's how God had to tell people how to live the law out. A, B, C, everything. Here's what you eat, here's what you donate. So that's what he had to do because the people were alienated from him. That isn't how he's done now. Now he changes people's nature. So they think different, see different, act different. He doesn't have to say, no, you can't eat that. In fact, one time Peter was they got a vision from heaven to eat a bunch of unclean animals. He said, I'd never have eaten anything my whole life. Now he's a middle-aged man at the time, so his entire lifetime, his entire lifetime, he had never eaten anything unclean. That's like a kid raised up when he's 50 years old said, I never ate any candy. If you wonder about Peter, what kind of person he was, this tells you what kind of person he was. Now he took the handwriting of ordinances, written by God, on how to execute the law, and he blotted it out. This is not, this is not how we approach God. This is not how we please God. We do not approach God by somebody else telling us what to do. This is not how it's done. I know that's a practical thing, but we're talking about being right with God now. We're not talking about just proper living and this sort of thing. That's another matter. We're talking about coming to God. You don't come to God on the basis of how many things you have done that he's told you to do. He blotted that. Now you come to God by faith, believing him. He spoiled principalities and powers. It's Colossians 2, 15. Principalities and powers, these are spiritual forces that ruled the world. They ruled the world. Spoil means plundered. He took away everything they had. So Satan and his host, they can't do what they want to do anymore. All you have to do is see this. It neutralizes Satan's power. He did that on the cross. See, it didn't, it didn't look like he did that. And Cleopas, the friend, didn't know. And Hebrews 2.14 says he destroyed the devil. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. He destroyed the devil. I know a person will say, but it looks like Satan's not destroyed. Well, destroyed doesn't mean obliterated. It means he rendered him impotent in the heavenly places. If you can get up high enough, setting your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, if you can get up, High enough, look at the things that are seen, not the things that are unseen. You get up high enough, there's not a thing Satan can do about it. He's impotent up here. He's been kicked out Amen. of heaven. Amen. So you get as close as you can. You can get closer than you think. Get as close as you can. Satan's been destroyed up here. The only place he has power is <laughs> down here in the earth. Closer you are to the world, more of a friend of the world you are, more you immerse yourself in the activities of the world, the more power Satan has with you. 
And when you rise up here, he just looks Satan square in the eye and say, no. Not a thing he can do about it. But Cleopas and his friend didn't know this. He validated the new covenant. I often told people, I used to hold meetings and I'd say, I'm going to quote the entire New Testament in 30 seconds. <laughs> that ought to get them out. <clears throat> and I can, too. Quote the entire New Testament. 30 seconds. Maybe less, but talk about it without stuttering. This is the covenant. This is the covenant. That I will make with them, saith the Lord. I'll write my laws in their minds. I'll put them in their hearts. I'll be to them a God. They'll be to me a people. I'll remember their sins no more. That's the covenant. That's the covenant. It's summarized in Hebrews 8, 10 through 12. And he confirmed, he ratified the covenant. That is, he made it right for God to put this, for God cannot, now God can start writing his law in people's hearts and put it in their mind. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you wake up in the morning and, hey, I remember I got Romans memorized. That's not what he means. It means he puts in you an affinity. That means it fits together. So that when you hear the Word of God and the Law of God, you may never have heard that before. But you hear it, you say, I believe that, I can see that. And you never heard it before. You probably experienced it, you can probably name things. You heard somebody preach in truth, you'd never really thought about that before, but you could recognize, this is what God did, this is right, I can see this. That's God writing His Law upon your heart and on your mind. And Jesus inaugurated, not inaugurated, sanctified that covenant when he died. Because it, it's a blood covenant. Somebody had to die for that covenant to be put in place. A man couldn't die because men, they couldn't atone for their own sin, let alone for everybody else's. But as soon as this sin matter was settled, now, it existed for 4,000 years. It took God several millennia to get man to a point where he could talk to him about these things. Sin so alienated man from God that God could talk to man directly and he didn't have the faintest idea what he was talking about. When he writes the law in your heart, puts it in your mind, you become a true learner. All you need to do is hear about it. Sometimes you could read it, it'll come to you. And you shape your life around it. One thing you can learn from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, none of those men, there's no record of them ever disobeying God. You always did what he said. Leave her, Abraham does. Leave her and go to Canaan, Abraham does. Walk through the land, see what great it is, Abraham does. Offer your son on a sacrifice on a mountain. I'll tell you about Abraham did for all practical purposes. God stopped him through an angel. Isaac was the same way. God said to Isaac, don't leave. Don't go down to Egypt. Stay here in Gerar, which is a Philistine country. Now I'll bless you. Isaac, Isaac stayed. Jacob, he told Jacob, he said, go ahead to pay down around. He did Stayed there for 20 years. God said, leave and go back. And he did. These patriarchs always did what God said to do. Always. Because the hand of God was, they were, they were hand-picked men. And the hand of God was upon them. And when the law of God is written on your heart and on your mind, you'll have that kind of character. The kind of character that does what God says to do. You don't, you don't look for an out for it. Do I have to? Like one man said to me, how many times do you really have to go to church on Sunday? Well, I says, none. But you've got to consider the alternative, my friend. It's not good. You shouldn't ask how many times I have to. Or you should ask how many times can I. Amen. Yes. Amen. That's the approach you should take. See, well, I don't know it's so long. Well, what if someone said the Super Bowl is going to be 10 minutes? 
<laughs> well, you pay the money. You pay the money and break. I said, we are now going to have baseball games that last ten minutes. <laughs> and all movies will be five minutes. The church is the only person that's shortening this program. Why are they charging it? Because the people aren't interested. That's right. That's right. Why aren't they interested? They're not born again. Why aren't they not born again? They've not believed on Christ. Why haven't they believed on Christ? Well, some people have ne really never heard the real gospel. They're that kind of people. And Jesus, he made peace through the blood of his cross. Hebrews 10, 20 says he opened up a way. <laughs> he opened up, not a trail. He didn't open up a trail. He opened up a way to God. A new way, a living way. Living way is the way you have fellowship on the way. He opened it up. Whoever wants to come to God can. Now the purpose of preaching is to try to do your best to motivate people to want to go. If you do the ways, he did that when he died. Cleopas and his friend didn't know, didn't know anything had happened. Hebrews 8, 3 says he condemned sin in the flesh, that's the flesh of his son. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says he became poor for your sakes, mm -hmm. that we through his poverty might be made rich. Not dollars rich. Jesus wasn't dollars rich. John Hagee and all these guys notwithstanding. When he died, he didn't give his estate to Mary, unless I missed something. Did he? He didn't have where to lay his head in a certain dwelling place. Jesus had to give up priority. He had to take the shield of divinity and put it in the scabbard. He couldn't fight Satan as God. He had to fight Satan as a man. Mm -hmm. A man brought us down. A man had to bring us up. Amen. Not an artificial man. A real man. Flesh and blood man. So Jesus put aside what I would call the prerogatives of deity. Things that he normally had the right to do, like, don't you think, Peter, I could summon 12 legions of angels and they come here? But how will the scripture be fulfilled? What I came to do can't be done that way. I'm going to have to, well, some angels had to minister to him. At the beginning of his ministry, when he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights, and at the end there was a crescendo temptation. And angels ministered to him, it says. Angels ministered to him. Someone said, Jesus was tempted just like we are. Oh, no, don't take that too far. He was tempted in all points. Like as we are. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. Lust of the flesh, turn these stones into bread. Lust of the eye, she the glory of these kingdoms, I'll give them to you. All of them. The glory of them. Pride of life, jump off. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, see Satan's Bible quarter. The Bible says angels will catch you that you dash your foot against a stone. <clears throat> see, he was tempted at those points. Now to confirm that this is true, have you ever been tempted to turn a stone into bread? Anybody? <laughs> he was. You couldn't tempt Jesus by a pretty woman. <coughs> you couldn't tempt Jesus. See, Jesus was of a higher order, so his temptation was of a higher order. But what that means is if you're, if you're really God's person, just as surely as Jesus overcame temptation, you can overcome temptation because every temptation... 1 Corinthians 10, 13, comes with a way of escape. Amen. You can get out of that situation. Sorry. I'm appointing all of this. Cleopas and his friend didn't know any of these things that happened. You may know they happened. They didn't know they happened. 
And it took them a few days even after this to see it. And I think they fully didn't see it till the day of Pentecost it's fully come. Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. And they didn't talk like Cleopas and his friend. Not after that. Not after that. I want to underscore the fact that they felt this way. Cleopas and his friend. They felt a tragedy had happened when actually the greatest blessing that has ever been conceived happened when they thought only a tragedy happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is because they didn't have peace. Their hearts were not settled. Their hearts were like a stone in the Sea of Galilee. They thought everything had fallen apart. We've been wrong. We thought he was the one. We, we, were, we were obviously wrong. Oh, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? Now, you've probably had times when you've had an agitated heart. Well, I've had them. I will confess to you, I've had them. Mm -hmm. In fact, they've been pretty recent. I was able to overcome it. My wife always tells me, she's my minister. Sister Jude's my minister. You see, we don't believe in women ministers, but I don't care really. I really don't care what you think about it. That's what she is. <laughs> I was able to recover because I know who's controlling the world. Amen. This is God's world. The heavens do rule. I said, Nebuchadnezzar knew that. Good lad. Why do if a church people don't know it, Nebuchadnezzar do it? He said he does whatever he wants to in the army of heaven and the heavens of the earth. Nobody can restrain him. No one can stop him. No one can modify him. So really, how would you <laughs> how would you explain fretting? It's the absence of peace. That's what spiritual peace is. It's what settles the heart down. Because mm -hmm. you can't think straight when your heart's agitated and you're all irritated and the devil knows what can take you off. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Preach it. Sometimes there's certain places you become vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They stop visiting them. Amen. There's certain people when you're around them you become vulnerable. Don't be around them. Yeah, but they're my family. Sorry. So you have to tell Abel to hang around with Cain? Is this what you do? <laughs> is it? No. See, this is dumb thinking. Don't. Whatever interferes with your peace, if you're discerning, you have to discern this, you understand. But if whatever interferes with your peace, declare war on it. Mm -hmm. Do whatever's necessary to get away from that. If it offends somebody, you can't think that way. You've got to think it's offending God. That's how you think of offending Christ. We're not being thankful to God. This is how you have to think. And peace will keep that posture. When the peace of God comes, it'll keep that posture. And you'll be able to look something square in the eye, this head, this hard experience, you'll say, I know. I know that this shall turn out to my salvation. That's what peace says. Peace says, this is not pleasant. I've been going through the fire and going through the water, but I know this is going to work out for my good. That's peace. Peace will say to you, well, if God's for you, who can be against you? Peace will say that to you. When you don't have peace, you never think of these texts. Am I right? You never think of these texts when you don't have peace. So spiritual peace, my what a theme. I'm not sure I'll be able to cover it like I really want to cover it adequately. But if ever there was a day when you needed peace, it's today. Amen. We are living in a fractured world with all kinds of uh, oppositions and encroachments on people and bigots rising up, dictators rising up, oppression. Even in nature, looks like nature is kind of getting riled up because of man. Yeah, nature's looking 
looking for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's right. What's going to happen when the resurrection of the dead? But I think give a little, at least give nature a little foretaste of what we children of God are like. Tame, tame her down, son. <laughs> tame her down, son. So I'm going to leave you with those. Well, I'd like to ask you. I'd like to ask you a question. Like, do you have this peace we're talking about? You don't have to answer me, but answer yourself. Do you have this peace that we've been talking about? This peace that knows what happened when Jesus died, and that that really addressed. All the issues. It really did. Jesus' death really did address all the issues that have to do with you and God. Do you have that kind of peace? If you don't, you can. You can have it. God will. You got to be the right place. You got to get where the blessing is. When Jesus was on earth, if you wanted to hear Jesus, you had to go to him. He didn't come to you. Well, there was a couple of people that came to a gathering demoniac that came to him. Then he left as soon as he, right away. Syrophoenician woman, he came to her. Then he left. <laughs> Most of the people, wanted, they had to go to him. That's what you got to do. So how do I go to Jesus? Well, if you're in Christ, he tells you how to come. <clears throat> Come with a true heart. Mm -hmm. This has got to really be you coming. You don't come and read something somebody else. <coughs> you come with a true heart in the full assurance of faith, having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. Make sure your sins aren't hounding you. Mm -hmm. And he'll receive you. He'll receive you. And he'll give you peace. I'll touch on it later, but one of the blessings Paul bestowed on the Thessalonians, he said, May the Lord give you peace always by all means. <laughs> That's where it comes from. So, my prayer for you is that grace and peace will be multiplied. Heavenly Father, I pray this for these people. That grace and peace that come only from you will be multiplied in overflowing measures. And that there will be a wave of thanksgiving rise from this congregation. It is unparalleled. Through Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.